two ways, the way of life and the way of death. And there is a great distinction between the two. You see, there are things that are much larger than just what we immediately see with our eyes. Indeed, there are many unseen things in the world around us. And as we navigate through everything that goes on, both in life and the people around us and things which have gone on in the past, even coming up in the future, they are all either moving towards God or away from God. There really is no lukewarm sanctuary. However, there is a lukewarm hell. And when I say there's a lukewarm hell, I don't mean that it's this nice place of, you know, mild temperatures and things which are easy on the skin. But instead, that is the condition of the souls that end up in that weeping and gnashing of teeth. It won't be lukewarm in the atmosphere around them, but that is the souls which may end up there. So today, as we come to our study of Revelation, we're going to pick up in chapter 9, wherein we see the seventh seal and its effects still unfolding. In many ways, chapter 9 is a continuation of chapter 8. It's kind of interesting how things overlap in the book of Revelation. You start to see the seals open up there in chapter 6, but then things take a pause. Or excuse me, in in chapter 7, there there is a pause where we see people be marked. We see 144,000 from the tribes of Israel be marked. We see a, a massive, countless number of those throughout the nations be brought in with new garments. And then when you get into chapter 8, It continues looking at the seals, and you get the seventh seal, being the the final of all those seals, and chapter 9 picks up on that. I know I'm I'm going off on a little bit of a a ramble there, so let's let's just get to the sermon, shall we? So Revelation chapter 9, we find that seventh seal still unfolding, and this is how the scripture reads. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star far from fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit. And there arose a smoke out of the pit, and the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Let's pause, shall we? The bottomless pit is in many ways a prison. We're going to study once we get to our sermon note side of things. We're going to read this chapter first. But I want to pause for a moment to emphasize that the bottomless pit really is in many ways the void that we find in Genesis 1. What we learn from Scripture is that God did create souls which have eternal value. In our world, we have mankind who is made in God's image. And there is something about our souls which are eternal and they last long beyond the length of our body. But in heaven, there are also undying spirits. Now, Scripture does not say they're made in God's image. So they are mightier and greater than we in their size and fortitude and all those elements of their demeanor. But yet, something about them is also lesser than us. Those angelic beings that we find in Scripture, they are lesser than man in the fact that they're not made in God's image. But at the same time, they have a higher station in heaven, being that they're just simply in heaven. They're on a different plane. They're on a higher level, but also a lower level. It's an interesting element. But they too are undying. And of course, we we know of Lucifer, the fallen angel Satan, the dragon, the, the ancient serpent, But there's a problem when you get these fallen spirits that do not die. They need some place to be housed and contained. Now, Peter in 2 Peter 2.4 references something very much like the bottomless pit, if not the bottomless pit, where he says, God spared not those angels who sinned, but cast them down in chains of darkness to the nether gloom beneath all worlds. The book of Enoch also describes people, or excuse me, I guess fallen angels, not people, being cast into a bottomless pit where they have jagged rocks covered over them. And we find this idea throughout Scripture of the battle between heaven and hell being one that is quite serious and it has very, very heavy consequences. It's not just something which, you know, the the ancient serpent can go and do a little bit of time in prison and come out and be okay. It's not one that just goes on probation or pays a fine. These are things which have real consequences and they need some real way to seal them up. So we find throughout the book of Revelation, this bottomless pit is very much the void. It is without width, breadth, or height. I mean, it is bottomless. It is implying that you're always sucked downwards. And we need to understand that the void is very much like that. Anything we leave alone in the world, it will go back to the void. If you don't repeat an idea, you will forget about it and it will be lost for all time. If you don't feed your dog, he will die. If you don't take care of your house, it will crumble. Everything that we leave alone doesn't just stay in the same state we left it, but things that we leave alone, they go downward. 
And this bottomless pit is that internal vacuum, this, this eternal vacuum of, of just absolute agony. There is no light. There is nothing. So what we find in Revelation 9 is not things being put into the bottomless pit yet, or at least not in this chapter, but we don't, but what we do see happening is things coming out of it. In verse 3 it says, And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And again, this goes back just to chapter 7, where we find those 144,000 being sealed and marked. But then there is also the countless number of Gentiles who were given the white garments and brought before the throne. So there's, there's a lot of people that God has spared. Those who, again, are sealed and marked by him, those whom he has chosen. But those who are unchosen, they, they are not just random people that are out in the streets that are just generally living good lives but lost. No, these are people that are given over to evil. They're doing evil and sinful things. Again, there is no lukewarm sanctuary, but there is a lukewarm hell. And it says in verse 6, actually, we didn't read verse 5. Let's go back to verse 5. And it says, And it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should rather be tormented for five months, and their torment was the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days, in those days men shall seek death, and they shall not find it, and they shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locust were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads were as crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates, as if it were breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was the sound of chariots of many horses running into battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and the power was to hurt men for five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue his name is Apollyon. One woe is past, and behold, there comes two more woes hereafter. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice of the four horns of the golden altar which is before God, saying, to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four seals, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, and which were prepared for an hour, and a day, and a month, and a year, to slay a third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were two hundred thousand, and I heard the number of them. And thus I saw all the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire, and of Jason, and of brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three was a third, of the, a third part of the men killed, by fire and by, by smoke, and by the brimstone, which issued out from their mouths. Now, for their power is in their mouth, and in their tails, and their tails were like unto serpents, and had heads, and with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men, which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not cease their worship of devils, of idols, of gold, and silver, and brass, and stone, and of wood, which can neither see, nor hear, nor walk. Neither they repented of their murders, or their sorceries, or their fornication, nor of their thefts. So, there's a lot of things that go on in this chapter. We get down to the end, we see that people are increasingly unrepentant. A good chapter to study in connection to Revelation 9 is Matthew chapter 24. And in Matthew chapter 24, we find a very serious text where Jesus forewarns a lot of the things that we see happening, both on the cross and here in Revelation, being ultimately fulfilled through Jesus' ministry in the course of time. When I say the course of time, I mean the course of all time. And the closer things get to the final hour, the further people get from repentance. And by that I mean people do not want to repent. And what we find here in the end is people doing, worshiping devils, openly doing things which are demonic. And in our world that happens actually pretty often. There's a lot of people who even identify as demons, saying demons are their now their pronouns and things of that nature. I mean, this is overtly the sort of thing that's talked about in Revelation. 
Now, it may not come with a lot of eerie music and style, and the relationship people may have to these devilish ideas and demons may not look at all like our relationship to Christ. Again, the devil does not care about those personal affections or anything like that. And we in the church, we need to understand that these nefarious things indeed are real and people are given over to them. When it comes to the question of idols, we need to also understand that idols aren't just things that we like too much. Idols do not care what you think about them. The scripture is so overt about this Old and New Testament. The idols of gold, silver, brass, and stone, which can neither see nor hear in a walk. They don't care what you think about them. Scripture warns us all the way back in Exodus chapter 20 when it teaches us the Ten Commandments. The definition it gives for idolatry are things you will bow down to. Will you bow down to the idol? The idols, they don't see, they don't hear, they don't walk, they don't care. They do not care if you like bowing down or you hate bowing down. If you bow down to an idol but hate doing it, you are still guilty of that sin. That's what we have to understand. This is, this is not something where it's just, I may like it, therefore I'm guilty of it, or I may dislike it, therefore I'm innocent of it. No, that's not how it works. If the world bids you to do evil, you are supposed to resist that all the way to death. It doesn't really matter the size of the evil, whether it be something that's rather dumb and petty, like bowing down to a golden statue or something more serious. Whatever the idols are, Whatever the ungodly untruths are, you're not supposed to bow down to them. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. The last thing we get is they don't repent of their murders. They're, they're fine killing. They're fine killing the innocent. We see people in our world even killing people before they're born. We hear of the sorceries. In our world, the sorceries are alive and well. People conjure up not just a few buzzwords with a, a magic wand. They may not say, you know, abracadabra, which surprisingly enough has Hebrew origins. They don't come and say that. Instead, they'll, they'll put out a story in the news, which may be entirely fabricated, but then that fake story or that entirely fake take on a story will then have real-world consequences that, that even end up killing people. They, they may you know, lead people to get involved in a war, or they may get people involved in, in you know, whatever it is. They, they may even create things that kill people as a result of untrue narratives and bad worldviews, which really do come back to false words, to sophistry and anti-Christian ideas. The sorceries of old are real. And that's one of the things which has been really hard for me to wrap my mind around. I know I'm over here preaching Revelation, and I fully believe in the book of Revelation, and I understand that it requires a belief in the mystery. But I didn't start off that way. When I was younger, I wanted to outsmart it all and think, you know, we can believe in scripture without actually believing in some of the, the unseen mystery and the unseen magic, but that's not how it is at all. You actually do have to believe in the, the angels and demons to really understand the depth of, of creation, the depth of the fall, because the world is fallen. The heavens and the earth do have to melt away. These things are, are true whether or not we like it. And once you actually start believing in, in the world in that way, then you start to have a renewed belief in God that really opens things up to his beauty. And the sorceries of old, people using fake words to have real influences on the world around them, that is something which is a huge problem in our world. In fact, you, you look in the book of Galatians, it talks about people being bewitched by false gospels. Our modern world is bewitched by the sorcery of false narratives. So many false narratives about how society is organized. Um, people will send out lies about, you know, who is or is not privileged in society, and, and people will believe that, and they'll go in and make ch decisions based on that. These are the sorceries of old. You'd have fake words, which then render real evils on the world. Next up, we have fornication and thefts. Uh, we live in an age where fornication is, is so... It is so, it is everywhere. You know, pornography is something which sometimes is so easy to define, it can become hard to define because it's in almost everything and everywhere you go. It's, it's hard to avoid licentious material in our world. Even if you just want to, you don't even go and actively seek stuff on the internet, you will find it in our world. Our world is overtly licentious. And we're just constantly bombarded with the results of fornication that it's just highly destructive. And then we can also discuss thieving if we need to, but I think we can, we can let our imagination work on that one 
for the purposes of time. Let's, let's get to our sermon notes now. The title of this message is Two Ways. And there are but two ways. There's the way of life and the way of death. And there is a great distinction between the two. Now, in Revelation 9, which is a continuation of Revelation 8, we do find that there are those that are afflicted by the seventh seal and there are those that are covered by the Lord. And if we are watchful, ready, and doing the Lord's work, then we have nothing to worry about. It will be very serious, but we really are given perfect assurance by the book of Revelation. I want us to go back to Matthew chapter 10 for a moment. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 28 through 31, it says, Do not be afraid of those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can damn both body and soul in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet one of them will not fall to the ground outside of your father's care. And even the very head, hairs on your head are counted. So do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. I want to bring that text to the book of Revelation. Because if we read through Matthew 10 quickly, we might think that it's the devil in hell who can destroy a body and soul, but it's actually God. God is the one who has the power to do that. God is the keeper of souls. We are not keepers of souls. And even the evil one is not the keeper of souls. God alone has power over a soul to keep it, to judge it, to, to breathe it into existence, and to really redeem and do all the things that, that are mercies and graces as well. So when it comes to the book of Revelation, we do not fear anyone other than God. And as long as we are counted among God's people and we, we seek God and we believe on the name of the Lord Jesus, then all will be fine. We have nothing to worry about. And also in this text, we are regarding souls. Scripture teaches us that souls have eternal value. And that's where we find ourselves back to the bottomless pit. The devil and his demons are themselves fallen angels. This is what scripture teaches us. They are indeed fallen angels. And that leaves us with a very serious predicament. What do you do with that sort of creature who's not confined to flesh in the same way that we are, who's not dying in the same way that a man might when he becomes weary? In Revelation 9, we do get the glimpse of that bottomless pit, which is in many ways a prison. Although we don't see the adversary, Satan, the ancient dragon, being placed in this bottomless pit at this point in this chapter, we do witness its clear introduction. And this is a woeful dark place. It is a hapless place, meaning there's no happiness there. In many ways, if not always, I do believe the void that we find here is, or excuse me, the, the bottomless pit is the void in Genesis 1. It is a place beneath all other places, and in fact, it surpasses all places to reach an unplace. It is a place where those who chose darkness are given over to darkness. And not just spiritually either, but actually. This is literally darkness. There is no light in the bottomless pit. It is without substance or width or breadth. And this darkness has no real reality. It is a place, again, that is without shape. It is just a terrible, prodigious place to be. But it is hungry. There's any fact to the bottomless pit is that it is hungry. It is always moving downward. And although we don't see wickedness being cast into this prison, we do see dark things being let out. Many of them on the earth, again, there are two ways. If you are on the earth in this time, you are either covered by the blood of Christ and sealed by him, or you are given over to your wanton and evil ways. Now, those who chose darkness, they are going to receive some darkness here. The woe on the land that we find coming out of the bottomless pit is eerily reminiscent of the plagues of Egypt. We even find them being reminiscent of other places in Scripture like King Rehoboam from the book of Kings. You, you go to 1 Kings chapter 12 and you find Rehoboam, who again is supposed to be this great noble guy. He's got a great heritage and bloodline and all that stuff, but yet he's pretty wicked. His own advisors and counselors tell him, your people will be honorable and righteous to you. You don't need to punish them in such wicked ways. And he says, you know what? My father was cruel, but I'm going to be crueler. I'm going to whip you with the tails of scorpions. And, you know, his advisors protest him over this, but he, he wants to be cruel anyway. He has no mercy. He has no real reason to be this terrible, but yet he chooses to do that. And as brutal as that scene is with King Rehoboam, what we find in Revelation 9 actually surpasses that. 
The ter terrors of the seventh seal are great upon the earth. They're greater than even the terrors we've seen in the Old Testament. However, those who are sealed and marked by God are not left in desolation. So as I've said many times, Revelation 9 is a direct continuation of chapter 8, wherein the seventh and final seal is loosed. And it is so important that we remember that 144,000 are sealed from the tribes of Israel, along with that countless number from all the nations. I know I've said that point many times in the sermon and last week's sermon, but I want to remind us that we should be grateful for that number. A lot of times people get worked up about the precision of that number, though it's quite remarkable that the 144,000 is tied directly to the bloodline of the tribes of Israel, whereas it explicitly says in that same chapter that there will be a countless number from all the nations who are given their white robes and brought up before God. So there's really no reason to get obsessed over the number, but there is a reason to appreciate the number. The fact that this number exists at all, that there are people, 144 from the tribes of Israel, and that there is a countless number from all the nations being saved, that is what we should be grateful for. And I keep driving that home because while the woe is terrible, God is saving his people. What Jesus said there in Matthew 10 is indeed true. If you're not the ones that can touch the body, but only the one that can destroy body and soul in hell. You have hairs on your head. God knows what they are. And he cares about you a lot more than how many hairs are on your head. So we have no reason not to. We have no reason to, to be worked up and afraid of this. We should only be assured and motivated to bring other people into the kingdom of God, into the church, into the family of God, so that we can then be doing what we're called to do, that they can be part of this bliss. And here in Revelation 9, we see that we see man being more and more resistant to repentance. Regarding the hour of our kind, Jesus said this back in Matthew 24, which we're going to look at here in a moment, but the closer we get to the hour of judgment, the less and less people want to repent. And of the two things that spook me in life still, one, there is an unforgivable sin. It's real. Do not blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Don't play with that. Um, it's real. Whether I like it or not has nothing to do with it. It is real. And then also, there are time periods where nobody repents. Scripture explicitly says, for the 42 months that the beast comes out of the sea, in Revelation 13, none repent. You're either saved and already in the Lamb's book of life, or you're unrepentant and worshiping the beast. There is no repentance in that time. And as we get closer to that time, less and less people will want to repent. And it bothers me because we see things in our world that suggest how hard it is for people to repent in our modern day and age. And I don't like that to be the case. I don't want to just write off a time frame and say, let's stop doing evangelism. No, it just means our evangelism is going to be much harder and we need to do everything we can to reach the lost. And the Lord has made it so easy. If we simply repent of our sins and believe on him, it's all over. But we don't want to do that. What... God has worked throughout making the heavens and the earth, even coming down, dwelling among us, dying and breaking forth from the empty, empty tomb. God has provided so much for us. All we are asked to do on our end is repent and believe. And with that, we find an eternal glory, eternal meaning, eternal hope, eternal assurance, but people do not want to do that. And the closer you get to the end of time, the more they will cling to their horrible, horrible ruin. And you see a shift happen even inside the book of Revelation. Going back to Revelation chapter 6, it's toward, we find at its end, in verse 15 and 17, that there are men who recognize God's power, and they fear God for a moment. Revelation 6, beginning in verse 15, it says, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the rocks of the mountains, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For great is the day of his wrath, and it is come, and who shall be able to stand? What we find here is people basically going into a small, cheap imitation of the bottomless pit, 
They, they really do. They go into like a small version of it. They're like dogs who go and hide in their kennel to avoid getting in trouble. They go there and they beg the rocks to cover them so that they don't see the hour of judgment. But what's so terrible is by the time you get to Revelation 9, people are not doing even that anymore. They're not even like the dogs who run and hide in the kennel. They are now just open in their fornication. And they, they look at God and say, oh, you're going to judge us for doing this wicked sin? Well, how about we do it twice now? Maybe we'll do it twice each day and three or four times on Sunday. The, the licentiousness, the perversion, the wanton ruin only escalates as people see the hours of judgment unfold. The double down syndrome, which we do have as a species, the idea that we don't really want to repent. We'll, we'll justify things we shouldn't justify. You know, we'll say something we shouldn't say. We'll take a stand. We'll attach ourselves to certain politics. And as those things reveal themselves to be corrupt, we won't let go of it. We'll double down and we'll try to argue our way out of it. We'll give non-answers. We'll give weaselly, you know, garbage so that we don't have to have any accountability. When Christ simply looks at us and says, repent, and it's over. All the stuff that we ruin ourselves with can really be sorted out simply by coming and repenting before all, Almighty God. And sometimes that's not easy. But a lot of the stuff that we hold on to could simply be easy if we just let it go, if we didn't keep doubling down on it. But we have that double-down syndrome of the brain. In Matthew 24, and I encourage you to read all of the chapter 24 of Matthew, Matthew 24, 6 reads, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet come. All right, so we hear this talked about a lot. And when I hear a lot of pastors talk about this, it's oftentimes to, to disarm or diminish worries that people have about the coming of Christ. But we need to understand what this text actually tells us. This doesn't just say there are rumors of wars throughout the ages. It actually says wars and rumors of wars. There's a conjunction there. There are real world wars. These wars will accelerate throughout the ages, climaxing at the final hour. And while there are also murmurs and falsehoods, there are sorceries, there are fake narratives that lead to destruction. There are rumors of wars. But the wars and rumors of wars are real, and the calamity they bring is very real. Nobody got up today and talked to their Byzantine neighbors. Nobody got up and said, hey, how are things going on in your Visigothic tribe today? How are things even doing in Rome, for that matter? You know, is the old Christendom of Rome still around? Entire groups of people have been smote off the map. People have seen such great and terrible wars that entire entire civilizations, entire bloodlines, entire families, entire societies and cultures and tongues have been smote beyond existence. The wars and rumors of war are real. What Jesus is telling us in this is that he, who had the ability and power to bear all sin on the cross, he also has the ability to sort out all justice. This verse is not trying to disarm people from saying, oh, you know, I'm just going to not expect Jesus to return, or I'm going to unbelieve in the spiritual affairs. It's telling us, you personally need to have assurance. The spiritual warfare is pretty real. But let the one who can carry all sin on the cross also carry all justice. That's what it's saying, because we don't have the power to sort out all justice. Sometimes we think that we do, and we, we really don't want that. And again, We've got to be very clear in this day and age. I'm not telling us to be passive at all. We have to confront evil. And we have to confront it with real testosterone, with the real righteous anger that God has spoken into our DNA, it's something which has been lost in a lot of men. But at the same time, we're not able to sort out judgment over the living and the dead. We're not able to stop the vile sorceries, the magnificent fornications that are of such despicable scope that they can just prey and ruin upon people. We don't have the ability to do that, but when we rely on Jesus, Jesus does have the ability to do that. And in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30 says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take upon my yoke and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest in your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Again, Jesus is not 
passive in low T, as people oftentimes try to twist this. Jesus is going to return with a sword. And even in Matthew 10, he reminds us he is coming with the sword. But what he is telling us is trust him. God the Father is indeed a good father, and God the Son is a very honorable. He is the honorable king. He is the good king. We're supposed to look at him as the noble king of kings, as the one who truly can judge and avenge all things. Being a knight in his army, the burden he will put on us will be light. Now, it will demand every loyalty and allegiance of us. It's not going to be easy in the spiritual warfare. But what Jesus expects of us is, again, we repent and we believe and everything can be wiped away. And I do encourage us to read Matthew 24, but I want to end with three verses. Matthew 24, 42, 44, and 46. Now, in this, it tells us how we really should react. Verse 42 says, Watch, therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Verse 44 says, Then ye be also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man will cometh. Verse 46 says, Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find him so doing. So there's three things it says. It says, be ready, be, excuse me, be watchful, be ready, and then be doing. If we are watchful, we are ready and doing the good work of Christ, we have nothing to worry about. But if we are not doing those three things, then the bottomless pit and its woes are, are awaiting. Matthew 24, 13 also gives us an assurance saying, but he that shall endure to the end, the same shall he be saved. Which is, also very much like Revelation 21, 7 that says, He that overcomes the world shall inherit all things, and he shall be called a son of God. Alrighty. So we'll end our sermon there. Hope this has been very meaningful to you. Be watchful, be ready, and be doing. I'm Pastor J. Dylan Proctor here at Kingdom of the Logos. God love you, and have a blessed day.